My name is Ravas Govindaraju. I'm the head of the School of Civil Engineering. Uh, I also would like to welcome you all to this uh, distinguished lecture series from the College of Engineering. We have a very accomplished speaker with us today. A um, couple of uh, announcements. I would like for you to hold your questions till the end so that we can pass the mic around to you when you're asking questions so that it gets recorded. Okay. To help me introduce the speaker, uh, we have uh, with us Dr. Arvind Raman. She's a senior associate dean of the faculty and the Robert Adams professor in mechanical engineering at Purdue University. He went to IIT Delhi for his undergraduate, was at Purdue for his master's, went to UC Berkeley for his PhD, and joined us in uh, 2000 as an assistant professor. Uh, Arvind's research interests are in nonlinear dynamics, uh, vibrations, fluid structure interaction. He could be a civil engineer, you know, with that kind of a, uh, that kind of research interest. I don't get to embarrass mechanical engineering faculty very often, but now that I do have the chance, let me tell you a little about some of his interests. Uh, so Arvind has essentially pioneered the use of cyber infrastructure in our community here for research, education, through advanced simulation tools, online classes, which are used by thousands around the world and led the College of Engineering in strategic initiatives for global engagement in Latin America. Uh, Arvind is also an ASME fellow, recipient of the Augustus Larson Memorial Award for the ASME Keeley Fellowship from Wadham College, Oxford. He's a College of Engineering outstanding young investigator and on also an NSF Career Award winner. Arvind. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I think we should uh, keep our claps <laughs> for our uh, distinguished uh, lecturer today, but uh, it, it is really a great uh, honor uh, here uh, uh, to welcome uh, our lecturer, Professor David Maidment. Uh, a few words about the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this lecture series started this semester and aims to bring uh, the brightest, uh, you know, the, the best, uh, the leading faculty around the world uh, to come to Purdue Engineering uh, and engage in a discussion with our larger community here on grand challenges as well as grand opportunities in the specific area of engineering. And today we are really proud and privileged to have Professor David Maidment uh, join us today. Uh, Professor Maidment uh, is the Hussein al Harthi Centennial Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, where he has been since 1981. Uh, in 2016, he was elected uh, into the National Academy of Engineering uh, for the application of geographical information systems to hydrological processes. He's a recipient of many, many awards, and I'm going to read out just a few here. Uh, the uh, Mike Howard Lectureship of the Texas Floodplain Management Association. He was named the Geospatial Scientist of the Year by Geospatial Media. He received the Rake Lindsley Award from the American Institute of uh, Hydrology, the Van Che Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and several others. Uh, he even has uh, the uh, American Water Resource Association name and award uh, in his name. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's give Professor David Maidman a big hand. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to talk with you uh, uh, here at Purdue about uh, something that I've been involved with for the past several years, which is the development of a national water model of the United States. And I've put a map here of the rivers of the nation that are simulated in this model, and also of uh, Indiana. And I'll show a little bit as I go in uh, what this means for Indiana and even for what this means for Tippecanoe County. So I want to start with a little bit of a philosophical introduction here, and this was a book which I worked on for four years, uh, quite a long time ago, a handbook of hydrology, uh, which covers all subjects in the field. And I asked myself at the end of this uh, effort, uh, how was the knowledge in this book worked out? And I came to the conclusion that the knowledge in the book was worked out by three methods, by deduction, by experiment, and by observation. And by deduction, I mean uh, by 
reasoning from an existing base of knowledge. So for example, given a certain proposition and a reasoning process, I reach a conclusion. That's the classical path of mathematics. By experiment, I mean the reduction of nature down to a small um, a microcosm and its replication in a laboratory. And by observation, I mean the direct observation of the natural environment. Now, I don't think there are 23 things, 23 ways by which new knowledge is discovered. I think there are three ways, and this is what they are. And in fact, uh, by combinations of them. So by deduction, uh, to me, the greatest example of deduction is Isaac Newton. And I know you've all got the Principia by your bedside table at night, so you can study the works of Isaac Newton. But this is uh, my copy of the Principia, uh, the wonderful translation made by the University of California Press. And in 1686, in the introduction of the Principia, N Newton said, the ancients divide the mechanics into two parts, that the rational which proceeds accurately by demonstration and the practical. It occurs that mechanics are so distinguished from geometry that what is perfectly accurate is called geometrical and what is uh, less so is called mechanical. Yet the errors do not come from the art but from those who practice the art. So in this sense, rational mechanics will be the science of motion resulting from any forces whatsoever and of the forces required to produce any motions accurately proposed and demonstrated. So this is what Newton wrote in 1686 in the introduction to the Principia Mathematica, and his contribution was he established mechanics on a precise basis and he used geometrical arguments to do that. Uh, so this is you know, very sharp edges, right? Uh, this is what Isaac Newton was about. To me, the greatest of the experimenters is Louis Pasteur. Uh, Louis Pasteur was a biologist, a French biologist, uh, and he simplified the whole world down to a laboratory, uh, he was the first person who demonstrated that microorganisms in the human body cause disease. He also was the first person who developed vaccines. So he developed the, the technique of vaccination, uh, initially for anthrax and for rabies. Uh, this was a foundation of scientific medicine. Uh, and for hydrology, it's hard to conduct laboratory experiments on a small scale, but uh, the Darcy, Henri Darcy, who developed Darcy's law for groundwater flow, is one of the people who, who did that. But for me, anyway, and, uh, Pasteur is an exemplar of the experimental method. And for me, one of the greatest observers of the environment was Charles Darwin. Uh, this is my copy of his book, The Origin of the Species. And he said, when on board HMS Beagle as a naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the inhabitants of South America and in the geological relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that context. These facts seem to me to throw some light on the origin of the species, that mystery of mysteries as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. On my return home uh, in 1837, it occurred to me that something might be perhaps be made out of this question by patiently accumulating and reflecting on all sorts of facts. That was my emphasis here, uh, which could possibly have any bearing on it. I can here give only one, the general conclusions at which I have arrived with a few facts and illustration, but which I hope in most cases will suffice. And this book was published in November of 1859. It recently had its uh, 150th anniversary, and it's been called the most accessible book of great scientific imagination ever written, and it's still in print. And notice the difference in philosophy between Newton and Darwin. Newton's trying to make everything with precise edges. Darwin's comfortable with ambiguity. He knows that the, you'll never resolve this, right? This is, so you've got one world here of mechanics, of prediction, of deduction. You have another world of observation, of uncertainty, of ambiguity. And it's in the bringing together of those two worlds, I think, that in hydrology we have to uh, contend. And this is a, a simulation that's been made by the National Water Model. So this is a modern form of deduction. Uh, given rain, we calculate flow across the whole nation. What you're seeing here is a simulation of flow on the three hour time steps for a three month period uh, during May, uh, June and July of 2015. There was part of the spin up for the National Water Model. Uh, and the colours here represent the magnitude of, of the flow in the major river systems uh, of the nation, of the continental US, and the blue is uh, smaller, and you, you can see as time passes the effect of storms passing across the country and the rivers of the nation, sort of like the bloodstream of the, the river system uh, that's flowing along. I first saw this, the President had a water summit um, in 2016, and we saw this at the White House actually when the, the uh, national water model was unveiled. But this is really an amazing accomplishment which has been achieved by the National Weather Service 
And so water is now continuously being simulated and forecast uh, throughout the nation uh, using this national water model. And I want to tell a little bit of the story about how this came about and then what some of the implications of its, of its existence might be. So <coughs> the opportunity was established when this centre was created on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama. This is the National Water Centre and it was established by the National Weather Service. Uh, and you may say, why Tuscaloosa? Well, thank you, Senator Shelby, who is that's his own hometown. And so, you know, 25 million or whatever, 50 million fell out of the sky and they said, okay, let's do it. And so this, but it was sort of an interesting thing because having a National Water Centre then created the opportunity to assess hydrology in a new way for the nation. So there was an opportunity here to sort of say, here's a blank canvas, how can we paint this in? Uh, <coughs> and in thinking about that, there are really four water problems that need to be solved. Uh, one is too much water, which is largely what we focused on, flooding. Another is too little water, not enough water, it's droughts. Another is dirty water, it's polluted, and then in e environmental issues, ecological integrity and so on. So in the larger scheme of things, the goal is to address all of these questions, but in the short term, flooding is the focus. And that f analysis is now conducted at uh, river forecast centres. The National Weather Service has 12 of these in the continental United States and these different colours that you see here represent the regions of the nation that are forecast by different river forecast centres. I think here you're in the Ohio River Forecast Centre region which is the blue one and you can see large river basins here that are forecast with a hydrology model uh, based on average basin characteristics. And what is now happening is that these uh, uh, the activity of these centres is all being nationalised at the national centre. So just like there's a national hurricane centre that deals with hurricanes wherever they occur, the National Water Centre will be the centre for doing flood prediction across the nation once all of this is uh, centralised and functioning from a single system. Now the computation is not done in Alabama, the computation is actually done part of the weather si forecasting system in Washington, but the management of the model is done in Alabama. So this is uh, the National Water Centre. Uh, there was a conference there in May of 2014. This was the people that were at that meeting. I was one of the speakers at this meeting. And <coughs> you can see, this, it's a Taj Mahal. This is a place, it's a huge building. And they didn't have hardly any staff there. And it's only slowly building up. And so I thought, well, you know, you could regard that as a problem or you could regard that as an opportunity. So that evening, actually, when the picture was taken, I proposed to the director of the National Water Centre, how about we create a new flood data modelling, forecasting, inundation mapping system for the nation, atmosphere to the oceans, coast to coast, near real time, high spatial resolution in one year. Just bring in the academic community and just crash it out. You know, I had in mind hackathons and sweaty bodies and you know, all this kind of student activity. And, uh, and I said at the end of this message, you know, if you think this is too crazy, it's okay. You know, just, just, don't, just put it in the garbage can, I won't worry. You know. But that's not what happened. They put this message up on the big screen in there and a couple of days later they said, okay, we'll, we'll go for it. And so what has happened since then is the National Weather Service uh, Innovators Program, which is a partnership between the National Weather Service um, and the academic community. And there's a money passes through the National Science Foundation to the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Science. And it includes the Summer Institute for graduate students and 105 graduate students from 49 universities um, have participated in summer institutes at the National Water Centre and a number of them are here in the room. So hey, if you've been to the summer institute, uh, raise your hands. We've got some graduates here. Yeah, okay, Ryan, yes, yeah, so okay. So Dr. Mewade has been very, uh, uh, he's been participating in the National Water Centre summer institutes and Ryan was a, once a student when he was um, at Auburn University. So. Yeah, so your students have been participating in this experience and this is really casting forth a new vision for hydrology for the nation of being able to think about something at the continental scale. So, you know, this is uh, the simulation that I showed you earlier and it is based on this geospatial data set called the NHD+. So the NHD+, plus, NHD stands for National Hydrography Data Set and that's the blue lines on, on maps uh, the national elevation data set is the terrain elevation, the watershed boundary data set is all the drainage areas of the country, and the national land cover data set is the distinguishing characteristics of land cover. Each of those data sets took 10 years to develop, roughly between 1995 and 2005. Then it took 10 more years to put them together. <laughs> So that you have this area of land flows to this stream and this is the characteristics of that area of land and so on. So by about 2015, 
Basically, there are a lot of very small catchment areas on average three square kilometres and a reach length of two kilometres where each little catchment just drains one stream. So they all, the land and water systems shake hands one to one like that. Um, then all the computations are done on top of, those, uh, of that catchment system. The first um, prototype for the National Water Model was built and run in Austin on this computer, the Texas Advanced Computing System. Uh, that tank is right outside my office, 1.2 million gallons that cools the, uh, the tank uh, during the summer when it's too hot to breathe in Texas. Uh, and so uh, we used a small portion of the Texas Advanced Computing Center to do this. And what we were doing was to take a weather forecasting model, which is called the High Resolution Rapid Refresh Forecast, or the HER, so there's a weather computation, then that feeds weather and precipitation into a land atmosphere calculation model, which is called NOAA MP, which is the, uh, calculates the soil and water energy balance on grid squares. Then that's mapped over onto this uh, river reach model, which is here shown for the Mississippi River, which was all we had at the time we started this. And then that produces stream flow forecasts, which produce the probabilistic flood forecast that you see at the top there. So the pieces that were new in this process, the weather model and the NOAA MP already existed, but running them in real time and transferring the result over onto the land surface and routing it through the land surface, that was the new part that was developed with the National Water Model. We demonstrated that that could be done in 10 minutes for the whole continental US. And I have to say, you know, I didn't know, I didn't even believe that was possible when we started. I mean, I was the one who proposed it. You know, the whole country in 10 minutes, I mean, just, yeah, that caused a few ripples when that happened. Um, and this is using a framework called WERF Hydro, which comes from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and that's how all the dots get connected. So I want to acknowledge the contribution of David Gotches here at NCAR, because he's the one who built the framework that we use to do this. Uh, and so what's happening is that we've got the, what we call in, in uh, hydrology and GIS the vector world, which is the catchments and reservoirs and rivers and so on, and that's how the water is routed through the horizontal part of the landscape. And then over that is laid a grid. Initially it was three kilometer squares and now it's one kilometer squares. And all the land atmosphere calculations are done on a grid. And then a geospatial transformation is done of the runoff from the grid squares onto the catchments. And then everything is routed through the horizontal uh, flow system. That's how this process works. And in the, so what's happened is that all of this has now been moved into the nation's uh, water forecasting system. So in Washington, there's something called the WCOS, which stands for Weather and Climate Operational Supercomputer System. So there's a big thing doing weather, and there's a smaller piece of it that now does water all the time. And so there's four models that are run continuously. The first is called the analysis model, which is the best estimate of current conditions, two days up to the present and the present. The second is the short range forecast, which is repeated hourly for 18 hours ahead. Then there's a medium range forecast, which is three hours time steps for 10 days ahead. Then there's a long range forecast, which is for 30 days ahead. Um, and there's five terabytes of information that's produced um, each day. So you see a little note there that says Wabash River at West Lafayette, Indiana. So this is the National Water Model rivers and streams in Indiana. Indiana is divided into 21,501 reaches uh, for the National Water Model calculations. And this is... Uh, Tippecanoe County. So uh, here in, in the county there are 472 uh, separate river reaches that are simulated by the National Water Model and the water flow is updated uh, every hour. And one of these happens to be on the Wabash River. I didn't realize until I started studying your campus that you've got a pretty big river that runs right uh, by the campus here. So on the Wabash River this is one of those little reaches. So the reach ID here says 102.05.115. And so that's a particular section of the Wabash River, uh, you know, right here in the campus area. And that particular uh, river reach uh, has these uh, forecasts that were made. I, took, I made this uh, slide a couple of nights ago. And this is the orange that you see on the left is you've had some high flows here. I gather you must have had some rain uh, a few days previously. So you can see there's high flows and now the forecast is that over the next few days uh, the Wabash River is going to drop down, but it's still going to be 2,000 C or 3,000 CFS. So, I mean, that's a pretty big flow by itself. So it's still going to be up, but not as high as it was for a few days earlier. So the orange is the analysis model of what was going on up to the time the forecast was made. The red that you see here is a short-range forecast for 18 hours ahead, and then the purple is a medium-range forecast, which goes for 10 days ahead. So this is being calculated everywhere all, all over the country, and this is what the current forecasts are 
for the Wabash River. Now, I want to turn to a different subject here now, and that's Hurricane Harvey, which has uh, had a particular personal impact on me. Um, so this is uh, Harvey. It, uh, it came ashore, Hurricane Harvey came ashore on uh, the night of August 25th. So if you see, the, if you follow the hurricane track, um, as it came in from the Gulf, the intensity of the hurricane intensified. Uh, it went up from being a tropical storm, which is the thing marked in green, to various levels of hurricane, and finally was Category 4 hurricane, of one, winds of 130 miles an hour when it reached uh, the coast, which was near Rockport, Texas, which is, um, yeah, well, I, I used to have a condo <laughs> at Port Aransas, which got the roof ripped off. And so there was, we had a catastrophe there. Um, it's, it's wrecked our coast with the high, high velocity winds. However, the hurricane went inland, and then it turned around and went back out to, to the Gulf again. And even while it was still in the, uh, out in the Gulf, you can see the rain bands over Houston. So Houston is 165 miles to the northeast of Rockport, but the hurricane impacted Houston in southeast Texas, despite the fact that the center of the hurricane never passed over that area. So the hurricane was spinning, it was bringing in big rain bands of water off the Gulf, and it was just deluging southeast Texas without ever covering the area that was most impacted by uh, its effect. So I've marked on the bottom here five days. So the hurricane came ashore about 10 o'clock at night uh, on the 25th of August, and it continued raining for five days. It was kind of like a Noah's flood happened. Um, in that time, uh, Hur Hurricane Harvey was the worst storm ever recorded in the history of the nation. So on the vertical axis of this chart is the amount of rain, the depth of rain that fell. On the horizontal axis is the area over which it fell. And the, from 1,000 miles to 50,000 square miles, the dots that you see here represent the worst storms that have ever occurred in the history of the nation. And so there's the second most, the third most, the fourth most, the fifth most. Harvey is number one in all cases. And if you take the average between the blue dots and the orange line, that's 11 inches of rain. Now, 11 inches of rain is a catastrophe all by itself. This is 11 inches of rain on top of the worst storms that have ever happened in the history of the nation. That's what Harvey was. This is, I mean, off the charts doesn't even record this fact. This is completely unprecedented level of event um, in the country. For three days, Harvey was five inches more than previous storms. For two days, it was right at the top of the previous storms. <coughs> so I was 10 days at our state operations center uh, in Austin, helping the Texas Division of Emergency Management do a flood res emergency response for Hurricane Harvey. And I have to say it was the 10 most intense days of my life. Uh, you just cannot imagine the pressure that's involved with dealing with a catastrophe of this size. There were hundreds of aircraft and helicopters. There were thousands of trucks and boats. There were tens of thousands of personnel. Our entire National Guard was mobilized, 16,000 troops. There are military people there. There was, the, there was urban search and rescue from all over the country was there. The way that the emergency response is organized is that Cities are within counties, and counties are within disaster districts, which you see these colored areas here. The disaster districts are within these green coordinating areas, and then at the top is the state operations center. So all the resources coming in from around the country are coordinated and re in response to requests coming up from the local areas through the disaster districts at the state operations center, and Chief Kidd is the one who makes the allocation, those allocation decisions. Uh, this is what the State Operations Center looks like when it's running. There's about 120 people in there. Uh, the first thing that happens is that there's a weather briefing, and the screens that you see here are some of the information that was being provided at the weather briefing. Purple is bad. Anytime you see purple, that's bad. And that's the flooding line. So every day they had flooding is bad. Um, and the different little red things that you see at the top there are the different functions. So one of them is finance, for example. I mean, you're spending just millions of dollars. You have to keep track of that because you know, somehow the bills have got to be paid afterwards. Uh, there's logistics, there's operations, there's deployment and so on. Um, communications. So every day there's a briefing, a weather briefing, and a, then a um, review of for, around all the disaster districts, and then a review around all the functions of the State Operations Centre, and then that's how the coordination is done. Um, we went in on Tuesday, uh, they said, oh, last night there was 26 inches of rain on Beaumont. It's now Venice. <laughs> so now, no, the, the water's just instantaneously, you got feet of water. Uh, by that point, there was an all-out assault, and all the resources are there. Uh, they had, the air was so thick, 
over Beaumont with helicopters. They couldn't get any more in. There were 85 helicopters up at one time, pull, you know, pulling people out of the water like you see here. Uh, and this is really dangerous work. You can see the operator on the hitch there. They go, the operator goes down, cinches the victim up to himself, and then they haul them up again, one at a time. And you know, they've got to come up through the trees. If somebody's in a tree, you've got to pull them up through a tree. You know, this is very, very dangerous work. And then they're into the helicopters, and then, then the helicopters went to the high points where you see the Chinooks here, the bigger helicopters, and the big helicopters shipped them out of the region to Galveston and other places. Um, now, this, is, this was a, uh, you know, an enormous effort. Uh, the Air Force was involved, the Navy was involved, um, and it's to be said that, you know, this is, in the Harvey, 80 people died, and every death's a tragedy, and I don't want to minimise that, but in Katrina, 1,800 people died, and it was because of situations like this uh, that a better response uh, happened. Uh, during the flood, uh, one night, uh, I, in the state operations, uh, operations said, I'm called Duck. You know, they're not professor something, and I'm just called Duck. I'm the kind of data guy. And I walked past the office of another guy, he's called Country. Country is the USA director, the Urban Search and Rescue. So he's, he had 142 aircraft and helicopters, you know. Country says they fly, they fly. You know, you get an aircraft, you don't get an aircraft. And his face was just absolutely fixed. And he called me into his office and he just said, Doc, I need data. I mean, it was one of those, you know, no fluff moments where you just, you know, you just cut right through all the talk. And so I suggested, OK, we need a request to the president of the university. So the Texas Division of Emergency Management um, sent a letter to the president of the University of Texas and said, look, we, we need help here. We need expedited water information that can help uh, with Harvey. So one of the things that we've been working on uh, with the uh, National Water Center and with the help of researchers, actually the, some of the people in the room here have worked on this, is a, is a method for flood inundation mapping called the height above nearest drainage or hand. And what that means is that if you imagine a point on the landscape where there's a house that if you say, okay, the depth of the water above the stream at that location is called the height above nearest drainage, if the depth of the water in the stream is below that, then you're okay, and if it's above that, then you're not okay. And we've computed this map of relative elevation, or hand, for the whole continental United States um, as part of the work that we've done with the National Water Centre and the Summer Institutes. Actually, this work was done at the Supercomputer Centre at Illinois, uh, the Rogers Supercomputer Centre at Illinois. Another thing that we've done is to um, count to collect all the address points in our state. So you may not realize this, but uh, every building in Indiana uh, to which you can make a 911 call has a dot on the roof, uh, metaphorically speaking. And so if you make an emergency call, that call gets routed to a dispatcher. The dispatcher doesn't see you, they, see the, they just see a dot. And they say, police go there, EMS goes there, fire goes there. In my county, there are 355,000 of these dots. In Texas as a whole, there are 9.2 million. So we went around all the emergency communications districts and we connected all these emergency points because that's where people live. So if you want to know where flood is impacting and how many people are impacted, then having these address points is a critical piece of information, actually. So <clears throat> during Harvey, what we were doing is that we had a system that was automatically converting flow into depth, a depth into inundation using the hand method, and then inundation into impact by counting the number of address points uh, that were flooded. So we take the discharge forecast from the National Water Model, we transform the discharge into depth by, by using a rating curve that's calculated from uh, the uh, hydraulics from the hand method. We create an inundation map from the water depth, and then we assess the impact uh, of, on people and property. And so, and the importance of this is that from a hydrologic perspective, from a water perspective, we go, okay, we've done our thing when we've calculated the flow, but from the emergency response perspective, it's how many people are impacted and where. You know? so we've got all these resources flowing in. <laughs> do we send the helicopters there? Do we send the high clearance vehicles there? How do you make those decisions in a major crisis? Uh, <laughs> so we had this calculator running, and this is a calculation that was made on Friday the 25th of August at 1500 hours, and it was at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Now bear in mind, the hurricane did not get ashore until 10 o'clock that night, so this is seven hours before the hurricane got ashore. This was the estimate of what the damage would be from Harvey from flooding. Region two has got here 238,000 addresses flooded. Region two is Houston, Beaumont, Port Arthur, it's southeast Texas, and that's what happened. 
uh, region six, which is the next one to region two, 22,000 addresses flooded. And so in looking back on the experience that we had in Harvey, I think this is a pretty important data point. What this said is that it was possible with this computational machinery to be able to estimate what the impact of the hurricane was going to be before it even got to the coast. Now, you know, this is only one data point. You know, we, we have to sort of go through a number of these things and figure out whether that's a viable method in the future. But, as, but assuming that it is, you know, you start thinking through what that means for public safety and for whether or not to order evacuations and so on, um, then that's an important piece of information, I think. I don't know if you knew this, but the largest evacuation in the nation's history just happened. In Irma, six million people evacuated from Florida. They thought Irma was going to go through Florida and the governor called for an evacuation of the state. Six million people left Florida. That's the largest evacuation uh, ever that's ever been uh, ordered in the, in the nation's history. Uh, but you know, you don't order those kind of evacuations trivially. Uh, in about uh, four, four or five years ago, after Katrina, Texas ordered an evacuation of Houston. Four million people. They tried to get four million people out of Houston and it was a disaster. More people died in the evacuation than died in the hurricane. Uh, so, you know, evacuation is a very critical thing, you know, how to make that decision, especially a big decision for a, for a huge city like Houston. One of the other things that we did with the address point data was to estimate the impact of flooding on major river systems and in the flooded areas. So, the picture on the left shows the inundation of address points on the uh, Natchez River, which is near Beaumont, and then on the picture on the right is an inundation area actually in Beaumont itself. The Red, uh, red squares that you see here are the US national grid. This is what's used for the deployment of air resources in rescue. So when the helicopters go out, they have a military system and they say, you go there. And that's the, they, they go there on the US national grid system. So the dots there are the address points, the blue is the inundation. Um, and lots of people contributed to this process. And just to give you a sense of the pressure involved in this, one night, our faculty team that was working on this, we, we had a telecon at 9 o'clock at night, and just before that we got the mapping in for five rivers, the Colorado, uh, Brazos, Trinity, um, and Natus and Sabine. And uh, we did this overlay here, and about 1 o'clock in the morning we concluded that 170,000 people were going to be flooded on the Brazos River and 50,000 on the Colorado River. And we communicated that to Chief Kidd about 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, I mean, you can, you can imagine, you know, this is... This is not small numbers of people here. This is a huge, huge impact that's going on. So this is our new Stampede system, Stampede 2. And so what we were doing uh, after we got the call from the TDEM, uh, the Texas Division of Emergency Management, was creating these flood inundation mappings uh, for local scale for use in urban search and rescue. And this is my colleague, Harry Evans. He's Chief of Staff of the Austin Fire Department. And he's been working with us for three or four years. So he's our public safety representative, and we do the science, and he does the connection. Uh, with public safety. But one of the things I've really learned out of this process is the enormous economy of scale of high performance computing. I mean, I just didn't know. I mean, I'm a hydrologist, I've been doing my laptop computing for, you know, decades. I didn't know you could pull off this kind of stuff. But it's just really amazing. There's an enormous economy of scale. You know, I just heard when I was at the National Water Centre, they say they can do the inundation mapping of the country with the hand method in six seconds. Yeah, and that, that kind of thing is really critical. You know, time it really matters. Um, now, where, where are we going to, how can we look forward? What does, what does this kind of extension of the Newton world, let's call it that, call for? Well, the first thing is we need more Darwin. <laughs> we need more observation. You can't suddenly go from uh, forecasting 6,000 basins to forecasting 2.7 million reaches. You need some more measurement to support that. So if you think about that, it turns out that there's 27,000 Texas Department of Transportation bridges whose flow is forecast by the National Water Model. Well, the US Geological Survey has gauges and that's considered the gold standard in hydrology, but what about all these bridges? Well, how about we do something about them? So it turns out that these 27,000 bridges are on 15,700 reaches um, of the uh, National Water Model. So we've got 15,700 entities here that uh, we're calculating and 27,000 structures that are sitting on them. And what we did <coughs> during hand, during the Harvey was we're working with this commercial company called Kisters. Uh, they have a big data system. Uh, you know, we're just hearing about cyber infrastructure. Well, this is in a commercial big data. And they, got it, they call it the PET. It's actually in Aachen in Germany. They're, they're ingesting all the flows from the national water model. They're converting flows to depths using the hand method. Uh, and then they're putting out forecasts of flow uh, and water level at each uh, of these forecast reaches. Um, 
And this was a portal that we opened up for the Texas Division, uh, Texas Department of Transportation during Harvey. So all the green dots here are the bridges that were in the impact zone. There are about 8,000 bridges in the Harvey impact zone. Uh, and it took three hours to do that. Now, you know, if you could have said to me we could have had a forecast portal for 8,000 bridges, you know, there, there's no way that could happen, but it happened. Um, and all the other dots you see there are US Geological Survey gauging stations in different parts of our state. Um, so in thinking about this, one of the things that we uh, have been testing in the Summer Institute is the idea that you can measure stream flow using radar. So the instrument that you see here is on the Cahaba River near Centerville, Alabama, and uh, some of our students uh, know the Cahaba River near Centerville, Alabama, uh, spent some time there. And so what's going on is that the level of the water is being hit by a radar beam, the velocity of the water is being measured by another beam which is at an angle and it's, connect it's using a Doppler system, and then a another measurement, acoustic Doppler current profile, is used to store the, or to calculate the flow across the whole cross-section, and by using the reference velocity at the surface and the flow across the cross-section, the whole thing's put together. And so the philosophy is let's put an instrument that just attaches to a bridge and use an indirect measurement of the flow, water surface elevation and discharge. Um, and when I started thinking about this, I thought, hey, wait a minute, you know, if I thought about this as a hydrologist, I have watersheds, I have outlets, I do all that stuff. But if I think of this as a transportation engineer, uh, yeah, uh, doctor. <laughs> so, um, if we were to do that, we would think about major highways. So this is the bottom line that you see here is Interstate Highway 10. Above that is 20. Then we have 35 and 45. We've got 30. So if you think about the highway system, we have... The, the highways go across this way across the nation, then they go down. Now, if you think about this in a sort of a scientific sense, hey, that's a transect model. We could, we could uh, instrument the highway system, the interstate highway system, and be sort of like picket lines. And so, yeah, we've managed to persuade TaxDOT that, yeah, we should do this. So they've started embracing the idea that when you build a bridge, you put a water sensor on it. And so our first uh, experiment is going to be on Interstate Highway 10, uh, this runs uh, all across the south uh, part of Texas. Uh, you can see San Antonio on the left and uh, Beaumont uh, on the right, Houston in the middle. Uh, these green areas that you see here are di districts that the TxDOT has for describing um, its operations. And we're going to lay out a, a transect of 20 gauges across uh, I-10. And if, uh, hopefully if this uh, experiment is successful, we'll do more of this. And while we were doing the, uh, this, um, planning this project, I asked TxDOT, uh, well, they asked, TxDOT asked for what would be uh, a build-out, you know, if we did the whole state. Uh, and so we did a calculation. I said, well, if that would be one gauge in 10 on the 15,000 reaches, it would be 1,500 gauges, uh, and the cost of that is about $50 million. Well, you know, $50 million is not too much for TxDOT. They build highways. One span on one bridge is $2 million. F you know, two lanes each way, that's $8 million. <laughs> yeah, six of those, you've got a measurement system. Um, and... Uh, it turns out that uh, we're starting to get a bundle of money back from the federal government. I think it might have even been voted on today, actually, that it's coming back to taxes. And so $5 billion is coming to our Texas General Land Office, and of that $500 million is going to go into a research program. And so, okay, maybe this $50 million is going to happen. So it's not, not out of reach at all that something like this could happen, and actually quite soon. Uh, that we could actually instrument our state. And if we did that, we started off with five year, 500 USGS gauges, we'd have 1,500 of these radar things. That would be four times the points of measurement that we have now. So let me finish then um, by saying that you know, I tried to create at the beginning a, a sort of a philosophical introduction here that says that there's deduction or prediction as one form of gain of knowledge, another is observation. And I think those two things go together. And we've done a big step forward in prediction here, we need a big step forward in observation to sort of match that up. Um, and it's an amazing thing, water is now like weather, forecast in real time for local streams all over the country. Uh, I, I guess those of us in hydrology just never really thought that was possible, but it is. Um, I mentioned earlier that high performance computing has an enormous economy of scale. I mean this is incredible what can be achieved. And this is a continental scale view of hydrology, so thinking from the top down and not from the bottom up. Um, the Hurricane Harvey was just way beyond any historical storm. And, and, uh, and there was an earlier storm in Houston, Tropical Storm Allison, that, that they said was off the charts. And I, I mean, hey, I've been teaching charts for 40 years. I mean, this is what I've been doing as an engineering professor. It really bothers me. Off the charts? What the heck is that all about? And now we come in with Harvey, it's twice as big again. Well, hey, that's way off the charts. 
uh, to me, that's a failure of engineering, frankly, and we need to fix that. I mean, this whole off-the-chart thing, and when you consider the public safety implications of that, it's just completely nuts. And we should be thinking about stochastic storm stimulation and bringing these storms inland and not just stopping them at the coast. You know, there's a serious deficiency of engineering design in, in this whole, whole area, I think, that needs to get fixed. Um, and I, that densified prediction you know, requires densified observation. If you go from the left at the bottom there to the cold continental United States, and then you're talking about the flow at the local portion of the Wabash River here in Lafayette, Indiana, you need more measurement than we've got now to support that. Thank you. Any questions? If you have a question, please raise your hand and Ganesh will bring the mic to you. Hmm. Very good, Dave. Uh, this national water model that you have, uh -huh. can it, it forecast? It, it can also use to you know what will happen, uh, say, uh, in, uh, or how far the the flood will take place mm -hmm. if I have this many inches of uh, uh, rainfall, mm -hmm. etc. With a given land use. Now, uh, after Harvey, the Houston is figuring out what to do mm -hmm. with uh, what to will allow building, etc. Can the model be used to find what areas to stay away from under certain, you know, the, because you have to really put the, uh, uh, as I was telling you this morning, the land use has to be brought in, and because the model you have is basically static, perhaps, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, some from uh, some way it has to be made uh, at least five, ten years increment, or I don't know what increment, the how the land use changes. And so that's a, that's that. a really good comment. And so when I put this note here that says need to use national water model in design mode, that's kind of what I was getting at. Um, so. Traditionally in hydrology, we've looked at the history of the rainfall that has occurred in the past and inferred design standards from that. But if you think of design as design for the future, so it's not just what we have built now, it's where to build. Uh, those are important questions. If we build there, what infrastructure do we need? Um, what I've seen uh, in Texas is that much of the trouble that we've got is the result of decisions that were made many years in the past whose consequences were un not understood at the time. Uh, subdivisions were established in low-lying areas whose risk was not known when they were established. They've become part of larger cities and suddenly they're flood-prone places and you have to buy them out. And in Austin, for example, our citizens have already paid $100 million to buy out houses from a low-lying areas to the south of our city. $100 million for a city of less than a million people. That's a lot of money. And it's, you know, there's some federal money too, but local money's being used for that. So I agree, and so the, this is really an important question here is to uh, how you anticipate where development will happen and what will be the impact of way, the way that's organized. Right now, you know, you hear Houston is a place like, uh, there's no zoning, right? Well, uh, I'm the chairman of a National Academy's panel on urban flooding. We visited Houston about a month before Harvey. It's the wild west of urban drainage, you know. Here's a subdivision that has no pipes. Here's a subdivision that has some pipes. Here's a subdivision that has ditches. Here's a subdivision that has nothing at all. It's like a patchwork quilt. So, yeah, understanding what the future development will be, and also if we have another subdivision and it gets put into this place, what will be the effect on others of having that there? There was unintended consequences, for example, sound barriers. You know, we put up a sound barrier for sound. Oh, wait a minute, that becomes a dam uh, when they have a flood. I mean, there are things like that that would just um, uh, you know, produce worse effects than what needed to be uh, in Harvey. Thank you, Dr. Maidman, for coming here. Um, so there are a lot of students in the room. So as an engineering professor who started with basics and now you are doing 
supercomputing. So what should we be training to our students to prepare them for all this? Uh, that's another good question. Um, I think we should be paying more attention to computational science than we have in the past. Uh, it's when, when we did this prototype for the National Water Model, um, which wasn't even called the National Water Model at that time, it was called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment, but uh, there was one routine in the model that we had that was about 100 lines long, and that was a real bottleneck in the code. And it took 10 hours to execute. <laughs> and somebody from the, the Tax Advanced Computer Center looked at it and said, oh, yeah, you need to use hash tables. And 10 hours became three and a half seconds. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what happened. 10 hours became three and a half seconds. That's how we succeeded in doing the whole country in 10 minutes. Now, a computer scientist spotted that. Uh, you know, my student who did, wrote the code did not know. And, you know, well, he was a hydrologist. How would he know that? So I think there's a greater need for integration of uh, hydraulic science and computer science and, and computational infrastructure, and understanding what that means. I think there's a big leg up there that we could be um, climbing on that we probably aren't right now because we, that connection isn't being made too well, I don't think. I was wondering what your philosophical views are on going in the other direction of simplifying things, recognizing things are unpredictable, stochasticity, nonlinearity, behavior of complex systems. So yeah, that, that's a good question. So uh, let, me, let me give you some reactions. After the first Summer Institute in 2015, what we succeeded in doing then was to go from rainfall to flow, but we didn't succeed in figuring out how to do the flooding part. And so a few weeks afterwards, I started thinking about this and I suddenly realized, wait a minute, you know, this is atmosphere to the oceans, coast to coast, this is one huge network. This is a network problem we have to solve. Traditionally, what we do in hydrology is we solve this one reach at a time and we agonize over, you know, how high the water is and what the bridge is. No, 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 this is a national problem. Now, if you're going to solve a national problem, you have to simplify. So the first thing I got was, okay, this is a network problem, it has to be solved as a network problem, so we have to think about the links and the connection among them. And the second thing that I realized was, in hydrology we've always, cut, we've always taken channel cross-sections by cutting vertically. But there's no reason why we couldn't do this. We can cut horizontally. So in fact, if we say, okay, we're going to now cut along the channel, and at a certain level we know how far the water spreads out, Oh, now we've got geometry and we have an inundation map at the same time. Oh, okay. And that's what we're doing with the hand. It's we're, we're cutting the channels along this way instead of cutting them that way. Now, by doing that and by, really sim by just saying at this flow, this level is going to be obtained, it's a really simple model. And lots of people hate it for that reason. They say, oh, yeah, it's horrible. It's much better. There's this flood. You know, there's, yeah, there's lots of other me methods that are better. But the trick is that what can you do that's of acceptable accuracy that can be executed fast enough that you can achieve the result over the whole nation? And that's what we're trying to do with the hand method. We're trying to simplify the whole process. Now, if we can do a better solution, then, then that's fine. But yeah, I, I, I've had an experience in the past that I say any fool can be complicated. It takes real insight to be simple. If you get, if you get something simple, then you can generalize it out to a lot of uh, ways. And for example, I went to see the uh, local urban search and rescue team operating in Austin, the, the boat team that we have. We have six boats in the city. And I saw the commander, uh, his name is Chief Pomeroy. He said he comes to the place where the flood's happening. He's the incident commander, so he puts his vehicle there. And the first thing he does is he puts a rock on the road where the water is now, so we can tell whether the water's rising or falling. And I thought, huh, rock on the road, huh? I thought, and then he's getting messages all the time from his bosses back at the emergency operations center, how big's the problem you're facing? You know, how many houses are flooded? And he's saying, no, it's two o'clock in the morning, it's raining, it's dark, I can't see, you know. But wait a minute, rock on the road, if I know how high the water is, and I've got this hand map, I can just go, okay, it's that high, now here's my flood map. 
So I don't even need any model at all. All I need is the rock on the road and I can draw a map. So a simple model could be used by a local first responder to get a map without even using a hydraulic model at all. So yeah, I think simplicity is really important and especially at this scale it's important because you have to do things really fast to get solutions at this scale. Um, hello. Uh, I grew up in Houston, like, ah. my whole life, uh, through Allison. Uh, yeah. I wasn't there for Harvey, because, yeah. you know, I was up here at school. But um, what political changes do you feel should be recommended to just the state of Texas? Because I do know they have, you know, different laws in terms of zoning and um, just how they're allowed to develop their land. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. And Texas being what it is, I don't think the state's going to be telling local communities too much about how to conduct their business. Well, actually they do do that. They told us we can have plastic bags and some other things. But anyway, <laughs> aside from that. Um, so, so let's just take Houston as a case study. So, um, so in Houston, in the city of Houston, all the internal drainage is controlled by the city of Houston and all the big channels are controlled by the Harris County Flood Control District, which is the, um, and the, you know, one of the main ones is Bray's Bayou, just to give a sense of what's going on in Houston. Bray's Bayou is the, is the channel that flows, uh, one of the main flow uh, systems in the city. To lower the level of Bray's Bayou by one inch costs you $20 million. So there's a project for $120 million just to lower Braze Bayou by six inches. So there's a, Houston believes in engineering, I'll tell you that. Yeah, they, they've got a, a so-called flood czar, and he's an engineer, yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's an engineering solution. Um, the question of what should be done and where it should be done is something that I think should be better informed than it is now. And so if we were to follow uh, the the path suggested by Dr. Sinha, I mean, we should be planning out where is this development going to be for each new subdivision, what will be the local drainage pattern in that subdivision, and also what's going to be the effect of that coming downstream. And I don't think that's properly taken account of now. And even in Houston itself, you know, you've got Houston here, and then you've got all the outlying suburbs. You've got Katy, Sugarland, and all the, you know, all the suburbs out to the west whose flow is now coming into Houston. So uh, Houston's got what they call uh, the expanding floodplain problem. So 20 years ago, the floodplain was like this, and then 10 years ago, it was like this, and now it's like this because the areas upstream are being uh, developed and are increasing the risk downstream. That's what happened in the Meyerland area that flooded really badly in, in Harvey. So I feel like what we're doing could be used to better inform people so that they can make more, both for development and for individual land purchases, make more informed decisions in the future. And I think that's probably how it's going to happen in our state. I don't see the state you know, starting to rein in local control too, too soon. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, so I, I, I wanted to go back to your comment of, on the of the chart uh, data point. Right. I guess. <laughs> um, and my question is, I guess, a classic question, right? So we know that large events like Harvey are more probable than we previously thought, mm -hmm. right? The heavy-tailed um, uh, things. But assuming we knew that for sure, right? We, we had complete knowledge of the distribution and we knew what the worst case scenario may be. What is the economics of it, right? So at what point do we decide this is too expensive to you know, plan for this risk, basically, mm -hmm. and what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, uh, well, how, this say, Harvey was not um, completely unprecedented. It was equivalent to the probable maximum precipitation, which is the largest conceivable storm. You know, our state's updated our probable maximum precipitation estimates, and Harvey's right at them. So it wasn't like it was inconceivable. It was just that it never happened before. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I, my sense is that often. Solutions are easily implemented. Actually, what's happening in Houston is they're elevating houses. I mean, they're, they're building the houses up on a, on a mound. And <laughs> you drive up to your house because it's on a mound. 
not that hard to put it another, if you're going to do that anyway, just make it a foot higher. I mean, for goodness sakes, it may not even be that expensive if it's done ahead of time. So I think there are some solutions like that that could be implemented um, even for, uh, in anticipation of largely, of extreme and improbable events, and probably if the landowners knew and had that choice to make for themselves, that's the choice that they would make, actually. They would, they would plan for something you know, right out there, even if the municipal people were not doing that. Um, more to the point also, I think, is uh, we need to understand what the implications of this is. When we were at the State Operations Centre, there was an enormous gap between what we knew and what we needed to know. I mean, I was there. And uh, people were coming up to me and they were saying, should we stage out of Sealy? Should we stage out of Conroe? Uh, you know, uh, well, should I stage out of San Antonio and fly people and you know, just have airlifts? Uh, the, the first couple of days was just chaos. And look, what we needed was a water map across the whole landscape so that we could judge which areas were going to be flooded or were already flooded and which we had road access. And, no, and so in retrospect, we should have been able to do the hydrology and hydraulics to anticipate a water map across the landscape and see the situation as it really was. And then we could have informed the decisions that were being made. I mean, they, they, they deployed a lot of resources to Katy, a place in Katy, uh, then the water just came up, glug, 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 it's now an island, and glug, 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 they're all flooded. So all the rescuers had to be rescued. It was just crazy. So, yeah, I think we have to start thinking about stochastic storm simulation and the harveys that come on shore and thinking about, you know, beyond the range of what was being recorded at, uh, at historical gauges. And also thinking about design rainfall over an area. We've all said depth, duration, frequency. That's been a hydrology mantra forever. But we've also got for depth, area, duration, like I was showing. Well, why not depth, area, duration, and frequency? Make the whole thing into a four-dimensional thing, not a three-dimensional thing. Uh, and look, over the last few years, the perception has hardened into a belief that the sea level is rising. It's not even questioned anymore. And it wouldn't surprise me that in a few years' time that the idea that these historical storms are intensifying is also going to harden into a belief. And yeah, we better start preparing for that possibility, I think. <clears throat> all right, if there are no more questions, thank you all for coming. coming. One more round of applause for our speaker, David Mainman. <laughs> and I just want to let you know that if you have any further questions, there is a small reception plan in Wood Commons in Hampton Hall uh, immediately after the seminar. So if you have a chance, you can wander over there and have a chance to interact with him a little further. Thank you all very much. <laughs>